How are you, buddy? Thank you for coming. Today, I want to talk about the story of privacy online. And this is a story that, in many ways, is also the story of the internet itself. And to look at this story, we have to actually go back to the very beginning. Our story begins in 1991, when Sir Tim Berners-Lee created the World Wide Web at CERN. This was a seminal moment in human history. At this time, the web revolutionized the world. It changes the way that we live, the way we communicate, the way that we do business. It also created with it a massive business opportunity. And by around the year 2000, tech companies, the early ones, like Google and Yahoo, had figured out that the best way to make money online was actually through advertising. And the best way to advertise is to secretly collect information on all users and use that to serve better and better ads. Then, in 2004, the next step happened. That year, a college student named Mark Zuckerberg came up with a brilliant idea. He discovered that, actually, you don't need to secretly collect information. If you build a platform, people will just willingly give you their information. And with that, we had the launch of social media, giving rise to Facebook, Twitter, and all the companies that came afterwards. While this was happening, in the background, the internet continued to grow. In 2005, we hit 1 billion internet users. And this year, there are now 5 billion users online around the world. What does it mean to have 5 billion internet users? Well, the numbers are pretty staggering. Today, there are 500 million tweets created every single day. 294 billion emails, 4 million gigabytes of Facebook data, and actually 65 billion WhatsApp messages. And when you put this all together, in 2020, there were 59 zettabytes of data created. And to give some context, one zettabyte is 1 trillion gigabytes. And by 2025, this figure will have ballooned to 175 zettabytes which is a tenfold increase over a period of 10 years. Now, data by itself isn't a problem. The problem arises with how data is used, misused, and how it's concentrated. Because data today is power, and we see that power being concentrated in an extremely small number of tech companies that actually have an unimaginable amount of reach and influence and control over our daily lives. And what we've seen in the past seven years since we created ProtonMail is that a lot of the negative effects of this are coming to light. To give an example, in 2016, there was a famous, there was a famous Cambridge Analytica scandal. In this incident, the private information of 50 million voters in the US was harvested from Facebook and then used to influence the way that they vote. In this case, to try to induce them to vote for President Trump. Then we also see this more recently. In just the past couple of weeks, we learned through Facebook's own documents, no less, that actually applications like Instagram can, in many cases, be toxic to teenage uh, girls. Now, we don't actually know the full extent of all the consequences of data, because it's just getting started. And what we see here today is really just the tip of the iceberg. But what we do know is that it is already possible today to see some of the impacts that come from the loss of privacy. And we can really see this by taking a look at China, for example. In China, the government has leveraged the data from its tech companies to build a massive surveillance network that combines Big Brother with Big Data. And they do this through something known as a social credit system. Essentially, every Chinese citizen is given a score. And this score is derived from public databases and also what they post online. And this is used to determine their trustworthiness or maybe their political reliability. So this is a very scary world if we continue down this path. Now, you may look at this and say, well, I don't live in China. I don't care. This doesn't matter to me, right? But in today's globalized economy, your data is actually just one acquisition from going somewhere you didn't originally anticipate. And there's a good example of this from a couple years back. A couple years ago, the gay dating app Grindr was actually purchased by a Chinese company. And last year, the US government forced the application to be sold back to US ownership. Why was that? Well, they were afraid that the data from Grindr could be used to blackmail US politicians and therefore create a national security threat. Now, even if you're not worried about your data belonging to a company that is then bought and sold, with the rise of data brokers, 
it's actually very common to have your data cross borders without you being even aware of this. The maybe worst part of all this is that there's no possibility to opt out. Even if you don't want to participate in the data economy, even if you don't want to be you know, um, contributing to surveillance capitalism, today, tech giants are so large, so prevalent, and so dominant that there's no way to avoid them. And you don't have to trust me on that, right? There's some people, uh, journalists, who have actually been paid to do this experiment, and they failed. It's literally impossible. So this really takes us to a situation where the internet is at a crossroads. And there's two paths that we can take. We can continue on the current path, which is more surveillance, more data mining, more invasion of privacy, and the internet becoming a tool of control and manipulation instead of the beacon of freedom that it once stood for. Or we can try to take a different path, and this is to build an internet where privacy is a default. It may actually seem obvious that the second path, privacy by default, is the way to go. But actually, surveillance capitalism has a lot of supporters. And the argument they use to support it generally goes like the following. I don't need privacy because I have nothing to hide. The problem with the statement is that it's not actually true. Even the ones that say it don't actually believe it. And there's a very easy way to prove this, right? The next time someone comes to you and says, I don't need privacy because I have nothing to hide, you can ask them, OK, please give me your email password. And I guarantee you, nobody will take you up on the offer. So what that really shows is, at the end of the day, we all have something to hide because it's part of being human. And this is why I really believe the future internet is going to be more private. And this is not some dream. It's actually common sense, right? Today, we live our lives with locks on our doors, and we have curtains on our windows. I don't see people running around naked in real life, so why would you do that on the internet? When you send a letter, you put it on an envelope. So why would you send an email without encryption? If the government hired an agent to follow you around, record all of your actions, and send that to a central database, you would be very furious. But yet, when Google does the same thing, we accept that. Why is that? Well, the reason Google can get away with it is because we have no other choice. right? It's either consent or don't use the internet. And the key thing is, if provided with that choice, it is human nature to always pick privacy. So we need privacy. It's essential that we build an internet that is more private. It's essential not just for us, but also to protect democracy and fundamental human rights in the 21st century. So the main question is, what do we need to do to get there? What is the path to get to a more private internet where privacy is the default? Well, the first step is really business model, right? We need to make sure that the business model of the internet is one that aligns with the best interests of consumers. And a good way to understand this is to ask the question, who are Google's customers? Today, if you use Google, you actually are not Google's customer. What you are, in fact, is a product that Google is selling to its actual customers, which are the advertisers. And this is a fundamental misalignment of interests that will always make it very difficult, if not impossible, for Google to put the interests of its customers first, because that misalignment is very hard to bridge. At Proton, we take a different model. What we do is we actually charge users for services. So people are paying us to protect their privacy. And because of that, it's a very straightforward relationship. Because we are being paid to protect privacy, we have no incentive, financial or otherwise, to ever violate that promise. And in the end, I believe this also, in the long term, leads to better products. Because you can always do what the users want instead of what advertisers want. Another important element is we need to be sure that we don't allow big tech to redefine what privacy actually means. It wasn't so long ago, actually 2010, that Mark Zuckerberg famously said, privacy is no longer a social norm. If you listen to him in the past couple of years, he tells anybody that will believe him that all Facebook cares about is privacy. Google says the same thing, and so does Apple. But when Google says they care about your privacy, what do they actually mean? Well, big text version of privacy goes something like this. We promise that nobody will exploit your data except us. And if you think about it, that's not the real definition of privacy. What privacy actually means is nobody will exploit your data, period. 
there's no buts, there's no exceptions. Uh, that's what privacy means. And if we allow big tech through PR campaigns and other things to start to shift what privacy means, not only do we lose privacy, we also lose the meaning of privacy itself. And that's actually something that is very dangerous. The third element is we need competition and a level playing field. What history shows us is that innovation requires competition. But what the past 10 years demonstrates to us very clearly is that privacy also requires competition. This is actually illustrated very well in a case filed in December 2020 by the United States Federal Trade Commission. And in that case, the FTC wrote, without meaningful competition, Facebook has been able to provide lower levels of service quality on privacy and data protection than it would have had to provide in a competitive market. What this is really highlighting is that privacy and competition are two sides of the same coin. If you want to solve privacy, the easiest way to do it is to solve competition. We fix competition, we get the privacy part for free. The FTC case also illustrates very well the shortcomings of current privacy law. In the traditional case of a monopoly, you have a monopolist that buys out all the competitions. And then it begins to slowly raise prices. And those higher prices are the consumer harm that everybody suffers. And that's traditional theory. But Facebook and Google, they provide free products. They're not raising prices. So in fact, the existing theories on consumer harm don't actually work. But make no mistake, there is consumer harm. The harm that we are all suffering collectively is the loss of our privacy. And to put in context the legal issue that we're facing, what I'm showing up here is actually the main US competition law in existence today, the Sherman Antitrust Act, which was first written in 1890. So we take a moment to think about it. We have a situation where in the US, the world's largest economy, we are regulating internet tech giants using laws that were created before there were computers, before there was internet, before there was mobile phones, before there was app stores. This is a bit like bringing a knife to a gunfight. It doesn't really work. And the reason we are in such a situation is because in the past two decades, we've seen an unprecedented direction of duty from lawmakers, both in the US and also in the European Union and throughout the world. Now, the good news is this is starting to change. The tide is really beginning to turn. And we saw this first in Europe in 2020 when the EU introduced the Digital Markets Act. This is the biggest overhaul to competition in the European Union since the EU itself was created. And the momentum is also picking up in other countries. We see this now in over a dozen countries where there are either new legislation moving through uh, the Congresses or regulators taking action to enforce fair competition. A good example of this actually came from August uh, 2021 this year when South Korea introduced a law that essentially prohibits Apple and Google from dictating how App Store payments should work. And with this legislation, they outlawed the current practice where Apple and Google will sometimes take 30% of revenue on all uh, mobile payments. And when this law was introduced, what we heard from Apple and Google was, if you do this, you'll break the internet, you'll destroy the App Store ecosystem. But actually, South Korea passed a law and the world didn't end. And what this really shows is regulating big tech doesn't break the internet. What breaks the internet is not regulating big tech. And we need to do this because what is at stake is more than just our privacy. What is also at stake is competition, innovation, and even the creation of jobs. Uh, so it's a big issue that we need to confront. So is privacy by default possible? Well, if we're being honest, it's very difficult, right? It means small company startups facing off against massive incumbents with endless resources and huge platform advantages. It also means technology that is quite a bit more difficult. In the case of ProtonMail, we protect user data by trying to not have it in the first place. And this requires using end-to-end -end encryption and also zero access encryption. And if you encrypt all your data, you make your life tremendously difficult. It's a lot harder to achieve from a tech standpoint. But what we've seen in the past two years is that despite these challenges, uh, in fact, there is a path for privacy by default. 
we see it with Proton, when this year we were able to hit 50 million signups. And we see this with companies like DuckDuckGo, also Signal and Telegram, that have acquired millions of users just in the past couple years. So it's hard and it's possible. The reality is that building privacy is hard. It's extremely difficult to do. But it ultimately is what customers want, and it's also the right thing to do. And this is actually a very powerful notion. Because as individuals, we often feel powerless. It seems like there's no way we can ever change anything. But collectively, as a group, as consumers, and as citizens, we are fortunate to wield the greatest power on Earth. Today's companies only survive through the goodwill of their customers. And as citizens and as consumers, we can choose which services we want to support. We can choose services that put privacy and security first. We also can exercise the power of our vote. We can vote for politicians and governments that will enforce fair competition and hold tech companies to account. But more importantly, we can share the message. We can let the world know that privacy matters. And if we do all these things, what we can achieve is actually an internet of the future where privacy is the default, and the internet serves the interests of all people and not just a few people. Thank you.